All right, since it's after four o'clock now, we're gonna get started. Welcome everyone to our Germans Beyond Europe panel uh, for the Max Cotta series. I'm Maddie Queso, an editorial assistant at Penn State University Press. And I'm thrilled to be joined today by some authors of four new exciting books from the German studies list. We have Adam Blackler, author of An Imperial Homeland, Forging German Identity in South West Africa. Kristen Dickinson, author of Disorientations, German Turkish Cultural Contact in Translation, 1811 to 1946. Todd Concha, author of Georg Forster, German Cosmopolitan, and Patricia Ann Simpson, author of The Playworld, Toys, Texts, and in the Transatlantic German Childhood. I'm going to ask each author to tell us a little bit about their book, and then we'll open it up for discussion and they'll be taking your questions. You can submit a question via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen at any time. If your question is for a specific author, please note that and we'll do our best to get to as many as we can. Uh, we're going to start with Adam today. Adam A. Blackler is a professor, of, assistant professor of history at University of Wyoming. He is co-editor of After the Imperialist Imagination, two decades of research on global Germany and its legacies. Adam, please tell us more about your book. Well, thank you very much, Maddie, and also a big thanks to Catherine Yonner, Daniel Purdy, and everybody else who, who has made this process so wonderful. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I prepared a very short presentation. Um, uh, I'll definitely keep it within our allotted 10 minutes, um, and it'll be a pleasure to talk about the book. Uh, so here we go. Um, so there we go. So uh, an imperial homeland forging German identity in Southwest Africa ultimately seeks, seeks to reorient our understanding of the relationship between imperial Germany, also known as the Kaiserreich in German, and its empire in Southwest Africa. And I seek to do this specifically uh, through a focus on what I refer to in the book as colonial encounters, something I'll, de I'll define more carefully uh, in a moment. Uh, and through this focus on colonial encounters, I ultimately am able to do two things. First and foremost, uh, demonstrate how Africans confronted German colonial rule, something that I think has not been given, at least by scholars in the global north until very recently, a lot of attention. Uh, and also demonstrate how transnational entanglements uh, altered the formation of German national identity in the 19th and at minimum the early 20th centuries. And in making these claims and in pursuing this, this project in the way that I have, I think it really accomplishes two things of note, two, two significant things of note. First and foremost, it shows how the colonial experience uh, in many respects transformed German society uh, across a much longer time span than historians have typically given or examined the German colonial project. Understandably so, I think a lot of colonial projects begin in 1884, the, the official formal year of when uh, Namibia, in this case, was formally colonized. Um, this project begins in the early 19th century, so specifically in 1815, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, so it examines this period over a much longer time span which I think ultimately allows for the second big significant uh, uh, point that I make to accomplish. Uh, and that is specifically, it demonstrates just how important, just how influential Africans themselves were uh, in this process, and more specifically, in confronting German colonial rule. Uh, I think that in many respects, a lot of projects in the past have uh, intentionally or unintentionally uh, uh, cast Africans as maybe a monolithic population that were nothing more than victims in the face of, of, a, of an omnipotent colonial power. Uh, this is the exact opposite. This is a more holistic study that in many respects demonstrates just how successful African communities were, nations were uh, in challenging the colonial empire and the specific consequences that those successes ultimately had. So those are the two big things that an imperial homeland accomplishes. So to, uh, to move forward, I focused this study specifically on what at the in the 19th century and then during the colonial period was referred to simply as German Southwest Africa, which is the present day state of Namibia. Uh, 
Uh, and I chose German Southwest Africa for this focus, for this study, uh, again, for several reasons, but perhaps most importantly, this was Germany's first overseas territorial uh, acquisition uh, in April of 1884. Uh, and of equal importance, or perhaps even more notably, it was Germany's only settlement colony. Uh, and by definition, while all forms of colonialism are inherently violent, this is not my effort to create a false hierarchy, there is no nonviolent form of colonialism. But in this particular case, all forms of settler colonialism are inherently destructive, uh, one could argue inherently genocidal. Uh, and so as a space of, of German occupation, this was one that really demonstrates just how consequential the colonial project was to German society, not just people in government, but through to all, all facets of society, to all communities, all sectors of society before and after German unification in 1871 but also to settlers that go overseas, and then ultimately uh, the main victims of colonialism, African populations themselves. Um, and to demonstrate this, I break up the book into six chapters, uh, two, three parts. Uh, the first part demonstrates or focuses on the unofficial pre-colonial period. Uh, part two demonstrates or focuses on the, the immediate aftermath of German colonialism in 1884. Uh, and then part three uh, investigates a series of, of really uh, systematically violent occurrences immediately following the first genocide of the 20th century uh, against the uh, Herrero, the Ova Herrero, the Nama and the San and others between 1904 and 1907. So that is how the book, the book is structured. Uh, now, I mentioned colonial encounters, uh, just to define that phrase and then maybe to elaborate on it a bit as I conclude uh, in, in the coming slides. Colonial encounters, uh, I define in the book, and it's the main focus of the book, specifically as those formal and informal points of contact between Germans that go overseas, and in some cases those that remain in Germany, that take place uh, with African communities. So be a treaty negotiation, uh, be it a meeting, unofficial or otherwise, between a German missionary uh, and, a, and, and his or her uh, a prospective uh, congregation. Uh, uh, it could be a violent conflict, a formal point that actually brings these, these groups together. It also can be an informal point. And this is something that I think, uh, again, makes uh, this book uh, uh, noteworthy in that in, for in focusing on an informal colonial encounter, this allows me to show how colonialism also altered perceptions and identity in Europe among Germans who never left the, the European continent, among those who never had any idea or desire to spend time in Namibia. And this specifically happens through reading newspaper accounts, in some cases meeting with settlers that come back and visit Germany for a period of time, uh, and also through some really uh, uh, very violent, very racist uh, uh, spectacles and exhibitions that take place uh, in major urban areas. So to focus on one of those informal points, just to kind of give a case study here. Um, among the more infamous were the so-called human exhibitions. I'm referring to this as an informal colonial encounter. Um, among the most infamous uh, human exhibitions that take place uh, occurs in 1896, when um, for over six months, uh, peoples are taken from Namibia and other places in Africa to Trepto Park in Berlin and forced to basically be on display uh, for Germans, for to them to kind of experience their own colonial fantasy, to verify in their case whether or not what they view about the overseas world is correct, to actually see it for themselves. And so in doing that, it provides Europeans, or more accurately Germans in this case, an opportunity to either confirm their inherent uh, 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 of colonial fantasy, their perspective of the, of the overseas world, or to actually challenge it. And the challenges are sometimes uh, uh, the, the most interesting things to focus on. And so this is just one example of many that demonstrates your Germans in Europe were very aware of what was going on in Namibia and also had an opportunity to experience it beyond simply just thinking about it or maybe hearing about it on a, on a street corner one day. The formal points of uh, a formal uh, encounter would be something like those that occur with Hendrik Vitboy and the Vitboy Nama, 
uh, and members of uh, the German settler community that arrived in 1884. Hendrik Fitboy was one of the more prominent figures to very successfully challenge German colonial occupation. Uh, and for a very long time, was so successful that in his success, he ultimately managed to uh, 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 force uh, uh, Germans to evacuate Windhoek for a period of time. Um, and in his, in his challenge to colonial rule, uh, he ultimately not only uh, demonstrated that colonial fantasies that demonstrated Africans or portended that Africans were culturally inferior, demonstrated that was completely nonsensical, but secondly, it forced Germans to double down on this colonial project in Namibia. Uh, they didn't want to lose it, even if they thought or didn't think they would ever move overseas, simply because they thought uh, this would be a national embarrassment, ultimately, if this was successful, if, if Africans were able to uproot them from Namibia. So Hendrik, Hendrik Vitboy, through, through challenging uh, German society militarily, through negotiating uh, various treaty agreements, um, uh, diplomatic engagement demonstrated the fallacy of a lot of these horrific uh, colonial fantasies that Germans harbored um, before and after the colonial project officially began. Um, and so in these colonial encounters, to conclude, what ultimately happens in tracing them, it's more holistic in this, in this portrayal of, of this colonial project, but it also demonstrates that the horrific genocidal potential of German colonialism in Namibia was in fact there. Genocide was in fact a possibility, but in tracing it, in tracing this history holistically and over a longer time period, it demonstrates it was not an inevitability and ultimately something also that was not uh, uh, systematically or, or, or teleologically connected with the Holocaust. Um, and that is a big debate I, I engage with throughout the book. So thank you very much, all of you. Uh, and I look forward to hearing the rest of the presentations. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. That was really fascinating. Let's go on to our second author. Kristen Dickinson is Assistant Professor of German Studies at the University of Michigan. Her book, Disorientations, was the 2022 winner of the Harry Levin Prize for Best First Book from the American Comparative Literature Association. Kristen, please tell us more about Disorientations. Thank you so much, Maddie. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen as well. So can everyone see my slides? So my book takes um, a long view of German Ottoman Turkish cultural relations through the lens of literary translation from the early 19th century through the mid 20th century. Um, the book is divided into three sections that each focus on um, a figure within a larger kind of network of activity. The first section focuses on Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. Um, the second, Friedrich Schrader, who is an Orientalist turned journalist who spent about 30 years living in Constantinople. The third is uh, Sabahattin Ali, who is a modernist, modernist Turkish author who received um, a government grant to study in Germany and then later um, engaged with German literature in his own novels and also translated um, a number of literary works from German into Turkish. Through my focus on these figures, I show how German, Ottoman, and modern Turkish histories of translation were inextricably linked across a nearly 150 year time frame. As authors, journalists, and literary translators, Goethe, Schrader, and Ali were both implicated in and transcended the intersecting histories of German scholarly Orientalism and the westernizing reforms in the late Ottoman Empire and early um, Republic of Turkey. This is significant um, in that Orientalism and westernization alike asserted a one-way movement of modernity from west to east, which was tied to a simplistic understanding of translation as a mode of one-way transfer from an original to a secondary copy. Within this configuration, German Orientalist translations often served as a mode of gathering knowledge about a Turkish other and discursively fixating it in time and space. Uh, whereas late Ottoman and modern Turkish authors translating from Western European source texts often understood themselves as doomed to merely replicate what Western literature had already accomplished. The translations that I look at do not conform to this model of one-way movement, 
That is to say that they do not merely orient themselves toward an original that they are assumed to follow. Rather, they engage in what I describe as a form of um, omnidirectional encounter. I build here on Sarah Ahmed's work on the concept of orientation. According to Ahmed, orientations involve at least a two-way approach. When we orient ourselves towards someone or something, we are also approached by that person or object. And when we touch something, we are also touched. As a site of contact, orientation does not always affirm one's perceived bodily position, but harbors a disorienting potential that may destabilize the boundaries of both self and other. Considering literary translations between German and Turkish as one mode of textual, linguistic, and cultural encounter, I argue that there is no zero point of translational orientation. There is no clearly defined here and there, and by analogy, no strict original and tra tra translation that stand in opposition. As complex sites of connection, the translations I analyze rather upend dis these distinctions between original translation, West, East, and past present. So in order to make this concept of omnidirectional encounter more concrete, I wanna give you an example from the first section of my book. So the first translations from Ottoman Turkish into German were undertaken by a diplomat, Heinrich Friedrich von Dietz in 1811. Um, and they were published in Denk Friedrichkeiten von Asien, which you see on the left-hand um, of this slide. Uh, several of Dietz's translations were then picked up by Goethe and incorporated into his monumental West East Divan in 1816. Um, significantly, the poems in Goethe's Divan that are inspired by Ottoman Turkish source texts emphasize moments of excess and transgression, such as floods and the inability of the shore to quote unquote contain the ocean or figures who both conjoin and break down insurmountable geographic barriers. This emphasis on excess and uncontainability is linked, I argue, to the exceptional role that the Ottoman Empire played within the discourse of German Orientalism. Due to its relative youth and its history of domination in the Middle East and the Balkans, the Ottoman Empire was perceived as excessively present, which made it difficult to mythologize or relegate to an unchanging past. Questions of excess also tied, are, are also tied to the etymologies of the words orient and orientation. Um, in an era of increasing European colonial expansion, the need for reliable world maps grew immensely due to the impossibility of rendering three-dimensional space accurately on a two-dimensional map and to the absence of an identifiable east-west meridian, however, the concept of geographic and cartographic orientation developed into a more specific problem of self-orientation, which is expressed in German through the verb sich orientieren. This is the definition of the verb from Grimm's dictionary. I quote in English here, an absence of the compass needle to try to find the excess, namely the east of one's familiar worldly location. That the task of orienting oneself is measured upon the ability to locate the east as opposed to the west is due to the etymology of the word orient. Derived from the Latin orients, it can be translated as sich erhebend, soaring or, uplift, or uplifting, um, and designating the space of the orient as the land that lies in the direction of the rising sun. Accordingly, the verb orientieren, to orient, originally meant to turn toward the east. Grimm's quote, which identifies the East as the unknown or excess of an implied West, suggests the development of a problematic form of Weltorientierung or worldly self-positioning that is impossible to achieve with accuracy. It points to the inherent meaning of the word Orient as a non-locatable space that changes according to one's own position. Notably, Goethe describes um, Dietz's translations from Ottoman Turkish as Sternbilder or constellations. In the context of the Divan, however, Dietz's translations become navigational signs that are emblematic of spatial instability, revealing the impossibility of a clear-cut system of east-west orientation. Given the significance of Goethe's Divan for his own conceptualization of world literature or Weltliteratur, I argue that the poetry of the Divan provides for an alternative early reading of this concept. Whereas Goethe's scattered remarks on Weltliteratur articulate a Eurocentric form of literary cultural exchange, the Ottoman inspired elements of the Divan that I read envision a messier form of world literature as a radical questioning of one's own positionality. With this specific reading of the Divan in mind, the second part of uh, this, the first section of the book then turns to the first translations from German into Ottoman Turkish approximately 60 years later. These were undertaken by five translators over a course of eight years. Uh, during which different letters from the epistolary novel, The Sorrows of Young Werther, appeared in leading Ottoman literary journals. And you can see the, um, 
These were published between 1886 and 1894. I read these translations as a kind of debate in practice that preceded a much more formal debate called the classics debate, started by author Ahmed Mitat in 1897. Mitat defined a classic as a European work of literature, approximately 100 to 150 years in age, the value of which does not decrease over time. Citing Goethe as one classical author, Mitat did not believe that Ottoman authors had entered into their own classic period. Mitat's definition is important in that it reflects opinions of the time that understood literary translation in the Ottoman realm as a means of social reform, a way of achieving literary and cultural progress, and of catching up with the so-called developed literatures of Europe. Such opinions were conditioned by a worldview that placed Europe at its imagined center and that emphasized the West's originality and uniqueness, which the rest of the world was doomed to imitate. It is no coincidence that Ottoman conceptions of originality also began to change right around the same time period. So Ottoman lyric poetry historically did not praise ideas that could be traced to one identifiable author. Walter Andrews compares Ottoman poetry rather to jazz where masters render common themes in original ways. But around the turn to the 20th century, Ottoman Turkish authors became increasingly invested in questions of originality and authenticity, which fueled self-internalized accusations of belatedness vis-a-vis -vis the West. The Vertar translations are significant, I argue, in that they negotiate a much more flexible concept of originality at a historical moment when concepts of original and translation had not quite solidified into binary terms. These translations, I, I argue, orient themselves toward one another rather than toward an authoritative original text that they temporally follow. They partake thus in a more flexible understanding of originality that also reflects back on the structure of Goethe's epistolary novel, a text that garnered favor for Goethe and the German literary realm by way of its translation into French, and that incorporates a multiplicity of voices and mixed narrative forms, Vertar's narrative of modern subjectivity could also be read as a discourse on translation and the impossibility of a single unmediated or original narrative voice. Even more importantly, uh, the methods of translation used by Goethe's Ottoman translators, who freely omit entire passages, who change important phrasings, who add emphases where they say fit. Um, these tactics are closely in line with Goethe's own adaptation of Ottoman Turkish source texts in his divan earlier in the century. This kind of experimentation in translation is significant, I argue, at a historical moment in which Goethe was himself identified as a classic author whose writing Ottoman Turkish authors should seek to emulate. Um, this chapter and this, this section thus revisits the destabilizing force of Goethe's Divan to ask what it means to also read the Ottoman Turkish translations of Werther as Weltliteratur, as world literature. I argue here that by bringing his work into another cultural and linguistic realm, Goethe's Ottoman Turkish translators do not simply consecrate Goethe's role in a canon of world literature, but actively negotiate the terms of originality and cultural transformation that also inform his work. This reading entails taking seriously the omnidirectional nature of the Werther translations as texts that do not simply respond to and follow a original, but that rather serve as active um, and creative forces in and of themselves. And I think it's be at time. I'm not sure. Thanks, Kristen. Thank you so much. All right, our next panelist is Todd Concha. He is Distinguished Professor of German and Comparative Literature at the University of California, San Diego. He is the author of several books, including German Orientalisms, Thomas Mann's World, Empire, Race, and the Jewish Question, and Imperial Fictions, German Literature Before and Beyond the Nation State. Todd, please tell us about Georg Forster. All right, I hope you can hear me. And I wanted to reiterate Adam's thanks to everyone, uh, to everyone at the press and also to all the participants. This is fun to, to hear other people's work. So I'll just jump right in. Um, for many years, I knew the name of the name of Georg Foster without knowing much about him. I owned a half-read copy of Voyage Around the World and knew about his leading role in the short-lived Mainz Republic, but it wasn't until the spring of 2020 when the world went into lockdown that I began work on this book in earnest. Well, my movements were restricted to furtive walks around the block 
and occasional expeditions to Trader Joe's, I lost myself in Foster's vivid narrative about the wonders of Tahiti and the horrors of scurvy. I read his impassioned pamphlets that urged feudal subjects to embrace new liberties and studied his essays on botany, the book market and breadfruit. And I was drawn into his correspondence, which reveals his hopes for professional success and personal happiness, but also exposes his shattered dreams. His marriage fell apart. The revolution became a theater of cruelty and his fragile health disintegrated until he died a slow and agonizing death in a Parisian garret at the age of 39. Riveting material for me in my COVID isolation and equally riveting for his German contemporaries, most of whom could only read about the places and events that Foster experienced firsthand. Foster was only 17 when he set sail from England with his father and Captain Cook, but he was already famous when he returned and he solidified that fame with a bilingual account in English and German of his travels. He later fed the public's voracious appetite for news of the world by reviewing book after book and translating many too about other voyages to distant shores until the notoriety surrounding his revolutionary politics eclipsed his fame. My book is an attempt to get at what makes Foster tick, to pull together the disparate pieces of his work. To do this, we have to move beyond the personal and political denunciation that clouded much of his 19th and 20th century reception, but also to guard against the 21st century temptation to hail him as a liberal hero don't get me wrong, there's a lot to admire in Foster's work. He criticized European imperialism, denounced slavery, and championed democracy. But he also endorsed Europe's civilizing mission and made condescending comments about peoples and cultures that fell short of this standard. Georg Foster was a representative of the European Enlightenment with all of its virtues and all of its baggage, confident in the proclamation of universal truths, but concerned that precisely this alleged universalism might be Eurocentrism in disguise. The core of Foster's work lies in this tension between the one and the many, between universal principles articulated in Europe and global cultural diversity, but also between French revolutionary ideals and the intra-European contests or conquests undertaken in their name. Denunciations of European imperialism are the critical norm these days and for good reason, but often Europe functions as a monolithic villain in the arena of world politics. I've been interested in what makes Germany different in the late 18th century and the answer lies in the Holy Roman Empire. Long denounced as a retrograde impediment to progressive politics, which it was, it has recently been at least partially rehabilitated as an alternative to the modern nation state. Instead of a clear cut distinction between good and evil, we have more of a dialectical opposition. The revolutionary nation state heralded the advent of democracy and human rights, but brought with it imperialist aggression within Europe and beyond. Conservative Germans celebrated the organic diversity of the Holy Roman Empire against what they termed the machine-like uniformity of the nation state, even as more liberal writers lamented the abuses of the old regime. Georg Foster's thought moves within this conceptual framework. Writers in the German lands were not members of imperialist nation states with overseas colonies at this time. Foster sailed as a supernumerary on Cook's ship and his outsider position granted him a critical distance from the expedition 
that he both endorsed and criticized. Closer to home, Foster approved in theory of Emperor Joseph II's liberal reforms in the Netherlands and French revolutionary democracy, but he also witnessed the abuses of the occupying French army in Mainz. In the fall of 1792, weeks after French troops had entered the city, Foster called for a Mainz Republic that would be part of France and yet retain its distinct language and traditions, thus coupling the organic diversity of the German tradition with the universal vision of revolutionary France. In a slightly earlier essay, Foster extended the same logic to relations between Europe and the rest of the world envisioning what might be termed a kind of universalist particularism or cosmopolitan federalism in which regions of the world would preserve their individual character and yet be linked to a network of global exchange. In short, I view Derek Foster not as an anomalous outsider, but as a writer who works within a German tradition in which artists and intellectuals responded to revolutionary change in Europe and Europe's increasing engagement in global affairs. He shares this perspective with Herda, his closest intellectual ally, and also Alexander von Humboldt, who never forgot the lessons he learned from his erstwhile mentor, Foster, and Goethe as well, who kept his antenna tuned to the world from his outpost in a remote little village of Weimar. But that's the topic for my current book project, Weimar and the World, Germany in the Global 18th Century. The book on Foster is a first step in this direction. Thanks. Thanks, Rod. He's certainly an interesting historical figure. Um, our next panelist is Patricia Ann Simpson. She is a professor of German studies at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and co-editor of the Goethe Yearbook. She is the author of several books, including most recently, Reimagining the European Family, Cultures of Immigration. Pat Patricia, please tell us more about your book. Thank you so much, Matt. Can everybody hear me? Yes, thank you so much again um, to the colleagues at Penn State University Press, particularly in this series. I re re reiterate the thanks to my fellow panelists, and um, it is quite a pleasure and privilege to be a part of this illustrious panel. Um, now, the play world, Toys, Texts, and the Transatlantic German Childhood, joins a growing archive of contemporary scholarly books um, that is uh, polycentric. This is particularly polycentric. I pay attention to mobility, and that is, of course, one of the most important um, common points of the series, and also to the multidirectionality or the networking nature of the relationship between thoughts and things over a long period of time. Now, this is, I thank also the graphic designer for this wonderful cover, and if I have a moment, I'll talk a little bit about the image of the um, of Adeline with the yo-yo. But uh, the book is, is uh, more sprawled in structure. The table of contents shows its range and its ambition. I begin with a chapter in the early modern period called the Protestant play ethic, moving on to professional parenting and enlightened play with an um, anchor in the 18th century, revolutions in play, which I'll also talk about colonizing childhoods and, chapter four, and chapters four and five, function as kind of pendant pieces in the blurring of geographic lines um, in the kind of world of the imaginary of the play world, particularly associations between slavery, the Africa, African, um, uh, uh, the transatlantic slave trade, Africa, um, and, the, and the Americas. Um, ethnographic play illustrates a moment of playing with the world as well as in the world. And then we look more at the direction of the German language and it's taking root in publishing houses in the United States in the home and the nation. I move toward an actual German toy maker who emigrated to the United States to celebrate an empire of toys. And I conclude in a very brilliant house 
ever so briefly, I'll walk us through a couple of iconic images that tell a kind of case study approach to um, my overarching narrative argument. The Protestant play ethic, obviously echoing the work ethic, um, looks in particular at early modern religious and secular discourses about play, and in particular the need for the regulation of play and the regulation of pleasure. Here, um, play takes on a need for a pedagogical moment, and it also becomes a public enterprise. And this particular illustration is um, from 1631. Anna Kofelin herself had lost two children, and to teach the individual bourgeois subjectivity of children, she designed this house. The actual model is no longer extant, but it tells a story of demonstrating gender roles and class function um, of a bourgeois subjectivity in the early modern period. Moving on quickly past the Hausväter and Mutterliteratur of the late 17th and early 18th century, I look at enlightened parenthood and professional parenting. This particular gem, the Ökonomisches Handbuch für Frauenzimmer, has um, an introduction that comprises the history of its own publication. Um, it goes back to around 1800. And this particular uh, in, uh, iteration involves an appendix that describes how women are supposed to take care of their own children, influence of Rousseau here, and how to furnish the playroom, how to direct children, how to to play, the need for gendered play, and the um, it's a kind functions as a kind of uh, 18th century um, what to expect while you're expecting as well. It grew out of a cookbook, and a brief moment of homage to the Joseph P. Horner uh, Memorial Library at the German Society of Pennsylvania, where I found a lot of which is a treasure trove in and of itself. Moving on to the revolutions at play and the revolutions in play, Goethe is the center of this chapter, not for his particularly um, accomplished literary works, um, nor his diplomatic work, but for his paternity. And very early on, he developed a fascination with the guillotine, famously tried to convince his mother to buy um, a toy guillotine, a miniature, um, and she famous for August for his for Christmas and she famously said no, I followed that particular letter from Goethe's mother around the world and I will conclude with it. But the um, revolutions and the attempts to turn violence and brutality and blood into stories carries over into the um, next two chapters for colonizing childhoods and also for ethnographic play. This particular volume, I, um, you can read the title, I don't need to repeat that word, shows a kind of preoccupation during the actual age of empire with German moral superiority. Uh, this particular story uh, takes place in revolutionary Haiti and it is told in German by a very, very popular writer of children's literature. Um, and the, this particular novella imagines a world in which the actual um, European owner of a plantation goes to Haiti, eliminates the, the brutal overseer and um, forges bonds despite the revolution with the enslaved Africans from the Congo. And the storytelling um, continues through a particularly strange white settler um, optic of race in, in, in a children's miscellany, Auerbach's Kinderkalender, and these are also from about 1900. In um, the zodiac sign for Leo, we have the father of the family who is taking his little bourgeois family, I don't know if you can see the lioness and her cubs, to the other side of the desert to an oasis to get away from the heat and I feel ya. On the other hand, we have a, um, the Oktoberkind, a scorpion, a negakind, who is interacting with the text 
um, uh, that is printed underneath this image, and it is telling all of the young readers to stay home in Germany. Um, colonizing isn't all it's cracked up to be. Um, and in a final white savior Santa Claus moment, this kind of racial optic is undergoing parody, repeating the trope of cannibalism in Knecht Ruprecht in Cameroon. This first was published as a broadsheet in 1892, and it became enormous, enormously popular and was reprinted throughout the Age of Empire. We see here um, the cannibals of Cameroon taking um, Ruprecht's gifts and roasting them. Now, an ethnographic play in colonizing childhoods in the American imaginary, we move to the Urwald of Brazil. And this particular story is by a woman writer around 1900. And she is terribly preoccupied, not only with the protection of a doll, her name is Liesel, and her porcelain skin, but also the protection of the white skin of the child. Moving on to the North American frontiers and their, the uh, fascination with the Plains Indians, we have a parody. Again, the scars are um, white settlers on the prairie, and they have um, um, chased away through a terrible ruse the three um, Sioux chiefs. So we have moved from a world in which um, racial accommodation is possible in a kind of imaginary to one in which white settler, white supremacy is the only way to go. In Home in the Nation, the school and the home are um, joined and we have a kind of effort to self-optimize the child through Fröbel as an export, Friedrich Fröbel in the kindergarten, and his materials, his gifts move from toys to instruments of learning. I close with the empire of toys and Albrecht Schönhut's um, toy company, which was inherited by his sons. He began in Philadelphia. And here I show the ways in which history impacts the production of toys. Um, we have Teddy's uh, adventures in Africa, Theodore Roosevelt safari, and his amassing of a collection for the Smithsonian and the Museum of Natural, Natural History. And there's a resonance between um, one of the boys carrying his luggage and the production of the character from the circus ne Negro dude. And I just want to show them in um, color right there. I conclude in a very brilliant house with the resurrection of, of Goethe and the uncanny through opera. And this is from a um, uh, performance, an uh, anonymous review of a performance, the army of musical devils, crazy girls, courtiers, Carmen's, Faust, Marguerites, etc. And on a less uh, salutary note, we have the end of World War um, I, seeing the distancing of the American German toy uh, manufacturer Schönhut. This is one of the last moments when, before the very brilliant house comes tumbling down um, in the interwar period and at the end of um, uh, the beginning and the recession, I'm sorry, the depression, <laughs> the um, toy manufacturers went out of business. And on that note, I will stop and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Patricia. And thanks to all of our panelists for their really interesting presentations and insights. We're going to answer some questions now from our attendees. And you can still submit a question at any time in the Q&A. And if, again, if your question is for a specific author, please be sure to note that in your question. And I see a couple have already come in. So we're going to answer these live. The first is for Adam. Could you speak, speak more about the chronology of your book and why did you begin the study before the formal period of German, German colonial rule? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Uh, great question. Um, uh, many answers, but for our purposes here, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll specify two. 
Um, as a project that's very interested in national identity formation in and of itself, a very large topic. Um, I think Germany in the 19th century in particular is, is fascinating uh, because as, as Todd mentioned, and, and fr frankly, all of the authors in, in many ways already um, uh, mentioned, it's not a unified state. It's, it's also not an imperial one as well, at least officially. So this process of imperialism and this process of national identity formation in Germany was occurring in a pre imperial and a pre unification space. And so as a topic that was something that was very interesting to me to see how those two forces came together, uh, and how people adapted with with their own surroundings. And so to, to start that answer, it started with the with the premise of interest, how does this happen when these two entities don't exist. Um, but maybe uh, most most importantly, um, and, and to this question of how the genocide fits in, um, uh, I thought it was really important in the history of German colonial Namibia uh, to not make the uh, genocide seem as a natural or inevitable endpoint. Um, uh, again, that is not that is not a critique of any work that's out there. There's some phenomenal, necessary, vital research that has been done on the genocide and its consequences. This book adds to that to a degree, but a majority of it is focused on the pre-imperial and the pre-genocide era, precisely because I thought it was more important to focus on the holistic portrayal of this history, number one, and also to study to, to study Namibia uh, for its own sake, as opposed to, again, I'm not saying anyone did this purposely, but to say that it only mattered because it might be connected to a genocide in, in the next century. Um, so those are the two real reasons why I focus on the time period I did and why I expanded the lens the way I did. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Our next question is for Todd, and they ask, uh, what about what, what about you found from the work of Georg and Johann Reinhold on the evolution of German and Scottish thinking on environmentalism? Um, I'm not sure about the Scottish in this regard, but um, we normally think of colonialism or imperialism uh, with its impact on human beings and, and human cultures, but there's also an impact on the environment involved. Um, and you know, Cook went out into the world not just to find out what was there, but he brought with him animals and plants from England in the effort to transform Tahiti and other places that he landed into something like an English garden. Um, I think one way to look at it would be a tension between an understanding of nature as a self-contained whole. Um, there's an essay by Foster called um, Natur als Ganzes betrachtet or something like that. Um, that on the one hand versus the idea that nature is something that needs to be improved. Um, and so you get this um, in, in Humboldt and Foster and others, the, this Lucretian or Spinozistic idea of nature as an interconnected whole. Um, on the other hand, there's this imperialist tendency to, to make it better. And in the process, sometimes doing more damage um, than was intended. And so you, you find in Foster and some of the other thinkers, Humboldt in particular, um, a nascent awareness of the human caused climate change that can result from uh, these attempts to, to press the European flora and fauna onto the rest of the world. So that would be one short answer to that. Thank you. Um, our next question comes from Daniel Purdy, the series editor for Max Gata, and he says, he wanted to ask whether you all can describe a feedback loop in which these translations, travel narratives, and colonial impositions foster a more, more or less sophisticated German understanding of foreigners. How did these engagement alter German concep conceptions of African, Ottoman, South Pacific, or Brazilian peoples? Who should start? I'm sorry. <laughs> Up to you guys. 
I don't mind starting. I, that's a, it's a wonderful question. And it is um, one of, I think, the threads through many of the books in the series of Germans Beyond Europe. There is a kind of, at least in the play world, there's a kind of um, teaching of racial hierarchies that is replicated constantly. And um, there is a kind of Trinitarian relationship that const rather constantly puts um, well, white German speaking Europeans, even if they're in the United States, um, if they are in the jungle of South America or on the uh, coast of West Africa at the top of a hierarchy. But it also, and we've seen this kind of work being done by scholars like Laura Wildenthal and others, Susanna Zantop's book is, is, is foundational in this regard, that there's a kind of kinder, gentler German colonialism that is supposed to have taken place um, um, partly because of female influence and partly because uh, the nation state learned the lessons of the past from other European maritime colonial powers. So, uh, but it is, it teaches a kind of cosmopolitan provincialism to borrow terms from um, uh, uh, to historians, our colleagues, uh, Glenn Penny and um, um, uh, Nar Brad Bradley Narange, um, about, about a replication of a kind of uh, Eurocentric, German-centric top of a hierarchy. Even if there, that model includes a kind of understanding, a kind of contact, a kind of what um, one of the things that Kristen was talking about, a kind of affiliation, but it is affiliation by subordination in many cases but it is an aggregate of narratives. So that would be one of the things that I would enter, that I would say. Okay. Can I just jump in? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a tricky question with the German, the, the German Turkish translations that I'm analyzing because there are not a large number of translations undertaken across the 1800s. We see a significant rise in the number of translations post 1900 with uh, the German Turkish military alliance um, and the um, like the lead up to World War one and the establishment of the Republic of Turkey you see a new kind of burgeoning interest in in um, the political the Turkish political realm um, in the German sphere in the earlier time period that I look at, there are very few translations from Ottoman Turkish into German, particularly because German scholarly orientalists tended to treat Ottoman Turkish as sort of lesser than Arabic and Persian, uh, which were the other classical literatures. And they tended to, um, classical literatures of the, of the Orient, they tended to view Ottoman Turkish as unoriginal. Um, it was kind of, it utilized Arabic vocabulary, it utilized Persian vocabulary, it was written in the, the Arab, um, Arabic Perso script, um, and they saw it as sort of copying other traditions. What's really interesting to me is what is trans actually translated um, works against this more dominant narrative. Um, and so what is translated is still kind of working within the paradigm of German scholarly Orientalism, but also a little bit outside of it. Um, in that it's showing in many ways how creative Ottoman Turkish authors were, um, and in a sense, original in, this, in the sense that I was trying to bring about not as singularly original, but um, productive and, and creative and um, kind of a force of its own. And so I, I, I would say that my book is not arguing that these translations um, created any very public, like it really changed the public view of um, Ottomanness, but that in really interesting ways, it sort of worked with while also going against the grain of, you know, important scholarly paradigms. Makes sense. To say quickly, um, Foster spent a lot of his time translating. He was um, trilingual in French, German, and English, and he knew about a half, at least a half dozen other languages. And um, it, he focused on travel literature uh, out of the English, out of the French, into German, um, a couple things out of Italian and other things. Um, and his focus was on the world, and he saw this as a crucial part of um, 
his contribution to German society was to mediate. And so much of this knowledge of the world is mediated through multiple languages, through book reviews. And yes, there's of course perpetration of Eurocentric racist ideas, but there's also criticism of them. And I think it's important to break that up and to see um, he has ongoing debates with Christoph Meiners, who became a favorite of the Nazis later on, who was a blatant, outspoken racist. And, and Foster takes him to terms in, in, in no in, in, in uncompromising language. So uh, it's not a monolith uh, by any means. Um, I could say more, but that's enough for now. <laughs> And just to briefly, Daniel, great question. Um, there are much like the the the, the my co-authors, uh, a myriad of examples that I could uh, address here. But maybe just just one that jumps to mind um, was the background of the third slide I showed. Uh, Deutschland's Kolonienspiel, uh, Germany's colonial game, uh, came in uh, right up your uh, wheelhouse as well, uh, Patricia. Um, uh, this notion that cultivated among upper middle class bourgeois German society, at least this was the purpose, of, and even the rules, it says this, uh, an effort to make colonialism real for those that could afford it in the casual, leisurely space that is their homes, their apartments, uh, and it, it supposedly taught young Germans that all that was needed was to go overseas and have an adventurous spirit, and luck is involved, but you know your, your cultural superiority will, will win the day. Uh, and then when a lot of these individuals later on go overseas, they realize that is, in fact, the exact opposite. None of that is true. The same cultural, hierarchical, racial, racist, more accurately, tropes uh, that are inhib inhabit all of that mentality uh, were exposed for exactly what they were when they went overseas. Um, uh, and so perceptions of, of what colonialism was going to be like changed radically because of that. And then on the flip side, people like Hendrik Fitboy, he was being, German newspapers were comparing him to Napoleon uh, and not meant to be flattering, but basically saying this is someone much like Napoleon that we have to deal with. And I strongly suspect that no one imagined that would be the case uh, before 1884. So that's how I would answer that, Daniel. Thank you guys. Thanks a lot for all of that. Um, we have time for one more question. So I'll ask the one that came in first. Um, this is for Adam. You spoke of the agency of the colonized, but the last photo you showed on your slides depicted what appeared to be casual to defiant men in chains. Can you talk about the story or the provenance of that photo? Sure, that's a great question. I think Gail, I saw that uh, just at this last second. That's a great question. I have to admit, I had one more slide and I think that would have made sense, but I did not want to go over our allotted time. Um, uh, in this book, I in no way, shape or form want to uh, skip over or suggest that the genocide didn't happen or because I'm focused on on, on maybe a, another part of, of the colonial project. Um, I definitely want to give that its space and it's, it's rightful one because we need to study this and continue to understand how it was possible but that's exactly the case. Um, uh, the, the, the provenance of that photo uh, was from 1905. I believe the photographer is unknown, if memory serves me correctly. Um, but it's from, unfortunately, a myriad that exists uh, of, of captured African populations that survived the genocide, but later on were imprisoned either in concentration camps or effectively as enslaved populations without actually being called that. That's what they were. Um, uh, and to, so, so that does happen, but that was not the inevitable outcome, or that was not the inevitable um, consequence of German colonialism in, in Namibia. It was always going to be violent. It was always going to be horrific. But in tracing this evolution in the 19th century, this book very much traces how that was a possibility. And the reason why a lot of white colonists in particular seek to imprison and commit horrific acts of physical and, 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 and uh, cultural violence against Namibians is because they had proven to be so successful uh, in, in confronting the German colonial project that many white settlers believed in the end, not everybody I don't want to suggest, but many believed that the only way they could ever win was to ultimately imprison them and or kill everyone that they could. Um, and so it traces how that happens. And that is definitely not a passive process like that photo on its own may suggest. So thank you for that question. Thanks for clarifying that, Adam. Um, we are out of time. 
And so thank you all to all of our panelists for joining us today. And thank you for everyone who submitted questions and listened in. Um, and attendees will receive a follow-up email with links to all four books, and you will receive a special discount code for 40% off. If you'd like to find out more about our virtual events um, and, and these wonderful books, please visit us at psupress.org and follow the press on Twitter and Facebook. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.